I can't be the only person who has noticed this, right? The four classical elements of earth, wind, fire, and water show up everywhere in fantasy fiction. It's a trope of the genre, one as expected as late game grinding and lore dumps in JRPGs. They are often used as the foundation of a magic or combat system, or plot MacGuffins to send a hero on a journey. And despite their plenitude in modern fiction, their presence was much greater, believe it or not, prior to the Age of Enlightenment, mostly in esoteric and occult religions, but mainstream ones as well. But have we ever stopped to ask ourselves why they show up everywhere? After having researched the history of the Four Elements and their appearances in fiction, the general pattern I've noticed is that the Four Elements in religion and fantasy must be united in order to produce something of great value. But the more interesting thing is that there might be a psychological factor motivating the usage of the Four Elements for this purpose. I will demonstrate this psychological factor at work across multiple forms of media, and by the time I'm done, I promise that your mind will be blown. In order to set up those examples best, however, let us review where the concept of the four elements came from, that being ancient Greece. As far as I can tell, the ancient Greeks proposed the concept of elements in order to explain the way nature unfolds and evolves. They suggested that it was the intermingling of simple base elements that birthed nature's complexity. Before the four elements, however, there was an attempt to figure out what the first element was, the primordial element that gave birth to the universe. Thales of Miletus proposed water, Anaximenes of Miletus proposed air, Heraclitus proposed fire. These were speculations that carried mostly throughout the 6th century BC. It wasn't until the 5th century BC when Empedocles proposed that the three aforementioned elements plus Earth were the base constituents of all matter in the universe. It should be noted though, that Earth, Wind, Fire, and Water were not referred to as elements by Empedocles or his predecessors. They were referred to as roots or principles until the time of Plato. He first referred to them as elements most famously in a work titled Timaeus. In this text, Plato speculated that the primordial element was a mixture of the four elements. By bringing these four elements forward, the universe could be made. I will explain his reasoning for this and why it could only be these four elements in a moment, but I just want to conclude by giving some credit to Aristotle. Though Plato's speculations on the four elements were very influential, it wasn't until Aristotle, when he wrote On the Heavens, that they began to not only be systematized, but expanded upon, namely with the four qualities of hot, cold, wet, and dry. Now there are two questions to be answered at present. Why four elements, and how were they used to create the world? Plato speculated that God, or as he referred to him, the Demiurge, started with fire and earth. Without fire, nothing could be visible, and without earth, nothing is solid. Before God could mingle the two though, he would need a third element to combine them, a mean. But here, Plato encountered a problem. The union of fire and earth could not be completed by just a third mean because the universe is three-dimensional. Unifying two elements with a third mean is a two-dimensional idea, rather than a three-dimensional solid reality. Therefore, Plato surmised that God placed water and air in the mean between fire and earth, and made them to have the same proportion so far as was possible, and thus he bound and put together a visible and tangible heaven. And for these reasons, and out of such elements which are in number four, the body of the world was created. What we have established is that God used four elements because that was the number needed to populate three-dimensional space. By having them intermingle, they would produce the four qualities. And by having the four elements and qualities intermingle, new elements and qualities would expand outward until the known universe formulated as we know it today. 
Before I move on to the mind-blowing stuff, I need to introduce one last piece of Greek influence. When Plato spoke about means and dimensions, he was drawing upon the mathematical theories of Pythagoras, specifically his theories regarding the meaning of numbers. Not only that, he was trying to improve upon one of Pythagoras' theories, which involved the numbers preceding four. To Pythagoras, the numbers 1 and 3 were equivalent with God. This is because the number 1 represents perfect unity, or oneness. That quality is described by the number 3, for something can only be one if two opposites are united by a third mean. It's like Plato said regarding fire and earth. Where Plato improved upon this theory was that the idea of oneness, ergo God, could not be reproduced in physical reality, in three-dimensional space, without a second mean. Applying this to the four elements, the quote-unquote one here would be the primordial element that the Greeks were speculating on, the one that was a mixture of the four elements. In the realm of ideas, that one would be represented as two elements united by a third mean. In reality, that one is expressed in the form of the four elements united by two means. Now some of this might seem familiar to regular viewers of my channel because I talked about it in a video titled The Psychology of the Trinity, which I released in March of last year. The focus of that video were two papers written by Carl Jung and Edward Edinger both of whom applied the theories of Pythagoras and Plato to religion, broadly speaking. Their conclusion is the same one I will attempt to demonstrate when I talk about media that uses the four elements. In short, people are psychologically driven to use the number four as a symbol of both divinity and all-encompassing wholeness. In respect to the notion of wholeness, there are four directions, four seasons, four bases in our DNA, and four states of matter. In respect to divinity, there are four faces of Brahma, the four faces of God in Ezekiel's vision, the four Hebrew letters in God's name, the four castes of Hinduism, and the four aspects of God in Gnosticism. As for the four elements, the most pertinent example lies in alchemy which Jung and Edinger didn't talk about in these papers, but certainly did elsewhere. The belief of the alchemists was that through a perfect union of these four elements, one could obtain the fifth element. That fifth element was the primordial element that the ancient Greeks speculated on, the one that was equated with God. For the alchemists, it was their most coveted goal of the philosopher's stone, which contained within it that primordial element, the elixir of eternal life. Now that elixir went by many names, but the two most relevant ones include quintessence and ether, both of which were names given by Aristotle when he systematized the inclusion of that fifth element. The alchemists then built off that work by incorporating those terms into their religious practices. I thank you all for your patience. All that proceeded was necessary in order to clearly explain the mind-blowing stuff. With the following pieces of media, you will see a pattern. One where the authors have their heroes unify the four elements to achieve something of divine quality. First, I will begin with a video game series known as Devil May Cry. In the first game, one of the final items you obtain is literally called the Philosopher's Stone. Its creation via a union of the four elements is implied in its design. It is a dodecahedron, one of the five platonic solids conceived of by the aforementioned Plato. Plato equated each of the five platonic solids to one of the five elements, with the dodecahedron being attributed to the aforementioned ether. By uniting the four elements slash solids, you get the fifth element slash solid. Now not every game uses the union of the four elements to get the philosopher's stone or the ether, necessarily. But often, their union will produce something of roughly equal value. 
For instance, in The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap, you unite the four elements to get the most powerful weapon in the game, the Four Sword. In the Legacy of Kane games, one must enhance a weapon called the Soul Reaver with the four elements, plus darkness and light, to imbue it with spirit. Another game franchise that echoes the function of the union of the four elements, but doesn't reference them by name, is Dark Souls. As we learn in the first game's creation myth, the first flame, which is this game's equivalent of the primordial element, gave birth to the four Lord Souls, which represented light, dark, life, and death, obviously analogous to the four classical elements emerging out of the ether. In Dark Souls 2, one can gather four separate crowns that had been touched by the power of the four Lord Souls. By presenting the four crowns to King Vendrick, he blesses you with the most precious thing sought out by every character in the Dark Souls series, the ability to transcend the undead curse. When you die, you no longer go hollow, but remain human, giving you figurative, though not actual, eternal life. Outside of the western sphere of the Greeks and the alchemists, this union of the four elements was something that was also speculated about in eastern religions, like Hinduism and Buddhism. Just like Plato married the four elements plus ether with his five platonic solids, the Hindus and Buddhists married similar concepts in their esoteric practices. I will use a video game called Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne to illustrate my point. To get the most powerful item in that game, something called the Masakados Magatama, you have to first obtain 24 other types of Magatama. Then, you have to fight what, in Hinduism, are known as the Lokapala, which translates in English to four heavenly kings. They guard the four cardinal directions, represent the four seasons, and of course the four elements. Once you defeat them, you get the most powerful item. Now this reference to the Four Heavenly Kings is also seen in a couple of other games. One of them is Pokemon. Towards the end of those games, you have to defeat the four most powerful Pokemon trainers, who call themselves the Elite Four. Elite Four is a localized translation of the original Japanese. A more accurate translation would be Four Heavenly Kings. Once you defeat them, you achieve the most coveted status in the world of Pokémon. You become the Pokémon Master. The other example of the Four Heavenly Kings is one I talked about a few months ago, when I did a video on The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. What I'm about to present to you will be a condensed version of that video without the supporting evidence. If you want to check my work, go check out that video for yourself. Anyway, in that game, as I am sure many of you know, you collect masks that can give you special abilities. The way to get the most powerful mask in the game, the Fierce Deity Mask, is a process that bears a striking similarity to the one you go through in SMT3 Nocturne. To get that mask, you must collect 23 regular masks, though it is technically 24 because one is a combination of the Sun and Moon mask. Then, you must defeat four bosses and get their masks to get the Fierce Deity Mask. This parallels SMT3 Nocturne where you must get 24 Magatama and defeat four bosses to get the Masakados. But as interesting as this is, it doesn't address the relation Majora's Mask has to the four Heavenly Kings. So, in Majora's Mask, the four bosses are imprisoning four giants, which guard the cardinal directions of the land of Termina. As I laid out in that other video, as did other Zelda fans before me, the four giants, plus the character of Link, represent the five Tathagata Buddhas of esoteric Buddhism, which is a concept that evolved out of the Hindu Lokapala. For four of the five Tathagata Buddhas guard the four cardinal directions. The proof for this lies in the Japanese name for fierce deity, which is Kishin. And Kishin is a name given specifically to the wrathful forms of these Buddhas. Just like with the Lokapala, the five Buddhas represent the elements as well. 
Once all the masks are collected, and the four giants representing the four elements are united, Link gets the most powerful mask in the game, which represents the fifth element in the Japanese and esoteric Buddhist elemental system, Void, which is the exact same thing as Ether, albeit a different name. There are many other examples of the elements uniting to produce something of great value in other games, TV shows, and movies, which I will list in the description box below. The ones I presented were simply the ones that I believed illustrated my point best. I will reiterate that point before we conclude. The four elements seem to show up everywhere because, as Jung and Edinger said, they function as a sort of archetypal symbol to defeat or unite the elements themselves, or representatives of the elements, is to symbolically demonstrate the all-conquering power of the hero. It's a pattern that sits at the foundation of our myths, kind of like the hero's journey archetype. Seeing the four elements in a fantasy setting is as expected as a hero being called to adventure, venturing into a dark area, defeating a monster, and thereby achieving something of great value. That's my theory at least. What do you guys think? If you have any thoughts or criticism, please leave them in the comment section below. Make sure to hit the like button if you liked this video, that helps me out a lot. Make sure to subscribe if you want to see more in-depth analysis like this. Finally, if you like the work I do here and want to help ensure its continuation, please consider supporting me on Patreon or joining my YouTube member section. I will leave a link to both of those in the description box below. Thanks guys, and until next time, remember to stay safe and stay yellow.